the National Film Board and was there for what I guess about four years? Six years. Six years at the Film Board. Um, he was very involved in the in the occupation of the islands of the St. Lawrence River. He was very involved in the barricading of the area of the, the highway for the Jay Treaty business and he's now the program director of the North American Indian Traveling College. Thank you. Uh, we're going to be very informal. I think my talk is supposed to be on government. Oh, yeah. His talk is supposed to be 1950 to the present, which again is a period he lived through and had a lot to do with in terms of what happened to Indians. Well, 1950, I was three years old. <laughs> so I'll go a little bit beyond that, but can I take my yeah. jacket off? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> what do you think, sir? He's going to sing for you, Ed. Everybody's been asking us what Indian sounds sound like. You know, they've been hearing all types of Indian sounds. And when we travel around to nowadays, we figured that we should sing a real Indian song once in a while. <laughs> People tend to... Uh, You're not going to sing the Indian love call? No. <laughs> <coughs> uh, at some time, I'd like to use the blackboard. That's all right. It's your word. Okay. Uh, from the 1950s, the type of governments that most people were following, especially among the Iroquois people, were the traditional government. And at that time, in between, well, I would say eastern, like in Quebec, southern Quebec, southeastern and southwestern Quebec, where the Iroquois people lived, the type of government that they had were traditional forms of government. That's what we call longhouse. People have the Haudenosaunee. And uh, those people refer to themselves as the five or six nations. The government that they followed they always believed that they were nations of their own. They were not a part of Canada. They were not a part of the United States. And uh, I want to start from there and explain a little bit about them because I just come back from Sweden. There was a United Nations uh, conference and this is what I tried to explain to them. I wouldn't take the seat of Canada or the Americans. And when I was asked to for my opening remarks, why I hadn't taken a seat, I told them that they haven't made a seat yet for the Indian nations of North America. And so we're busy planning seats for the Indian nations of North America to be represented. But I want to explain why they consider themselves to be sovereign people, because at the same time they are still citizens of this country and they're still citizens of the United States. But they feel they, they, what they feel is that they're citizens of their own nation first. Just like I guess many people would consider themselves to be French before they're considered to be Canadian or Italian before Canadian. And uh, they have a stronger feeling with them. Now at this point I'd like to just make some... Uh, <coughs> I, don't, I didn't bring any illustrations with me because I just come back from a meeting with the... National Parole Board. I'm not, he's not the one or I'm not the one, but it's for some other reason. <laughs> uh, Now, 
represents the uh, Indian world. But when I talk to an Indian, especially an older, older Indian, he's going to tell you that our world is on, situated on Turtle Island. And the story goes far back. It's believed that Turtle Island, there's such a gigantic tree, they call it the everlasting tree. And on top sits an eagle, guardian of the Indian people. Now, the tree has four roots, which travels to the four corners of the world. And they had a philosophy that was based on peace, power, and righteousness. And that's before there was any contact with Europeans or any other nations. And this philosophy that they carried was that they were the United Nations. Because as he's about to finish over here, the five nations consisted of the Mohawks, Oneidas, Ondagas, Yugas, Senecas, and later the Tuscaroras, making it the six nations. Of well, the five nations, as it was known at the time, they didn't just all of a sudden got together. They too were at war with other nations of North America. They were at war with, with uh, themselves. And the nations at that time were no better than the nations of today. You know, today you, your nations and other nations are still fighting each other. Well, that's the way it was then, <coughs> until they had a formula for peace. A Huron and an Onondaga combined, two great Indian statesmen, came up with a formula for peace amongst the Indian people. They believed that in order for the Indian to be a great nation, a great race, they had to unite. So they gave them the formula for the five nations to unite. And they said that rather than fighting with other people, you sit down and discuss. You counsel rather than warfare. And at first it was given, this message was taken to the Mohawk people, who accepted it. Then it was taken to the Oneidas. Who accepted it? It was refused by the Onondagas because they had a powerful leader by the name of Adadaho. And Adadaho was a very powerful man. He had long hair. And people say in our grandfathers that tell us story, he had snakes out of his hair. He had seven crooks in his body. Very evil, powerful person. These two men, the Peacemaker and Hiawatha, not to be mixed up with Longfellow's poem, Hiawatha, <laughs> went to this leader, sending the peace song to him, have him accept the great peace, and then they went from there to the Cayugas and the Senecas. And they believe that this is the Mohawks, Oneidas, Onondagas, Cayugas, and Senecas. This again embedded here, told about how <coughs> their constitution, the laws that they were to follow. This again represents the eagle and the symbol here with the four roots. The four roots meaning that one root would go west, one east, one north, one south. Messages would be sent from the Iroquois people, from the Grand Council of these five nations. A message of peace and friendship. And this peace and friendship, would, they would travel. Today, as we've traveled to California, to Florida, the elders there have shown welcome messages that says that has been there for a long time. So they says it is true that your people have been here. Now, these are pigs. These represent, in all, 50 pigs. And all of these pigs are the same length. Reason for that was that in the Iroquois society, no one man was higher than the other. And so, this, each pig represented one sachem, or as popular known, a chief. There was clans. I belong to the wolf clan. 
There's two others. He belongs to the bear clan. The other one is the turtle clan. They're the three major clans of the Mohawk nation. So, as we got older, we would probably be selected and become installed into office according to the customs of our people as sachems. Oleane, that's what they the term in our language. <coughs> now, three of these chiefs are wolf clan. Three of them are bear clan. Three of them are turtle clan. So I sit behind my chiefs of the wolf. He sits behind the chiefs of the bear. Others, younger people would sit behind the chiefs of the turtle. Now the way their council is, <coughs> the whale is here, and here's the turtle, the bear, the wolf. By well, it means that if a bill is passed amongst the Mohawk nation, this is where it is dropped. <coughs> the clan mothers, the women folks, sit over here, and the people sit and watch the council or the debates. And so, for loss, for the Mohawk nation, would come here to the wolf chiefs. From the wolf chiefs, there would be discussion. Once they have reached an agreement, they went to the other side of the house, to the bear, who have been listening to the discussions. They all get up, after constant with the other two, a speaker will get up and says, we've been listening to the deliberations. It seems that this would be good for our nation. Therefore, we confirm it. We send it back to you, and then it becomes a law. Now, I must tell you that in that custom, women portrayed a great responsibility. For they were the ones who elected the chiefs to that position. And they had been doing this from time on before contact of Europeans. This is the system that they followed. And they also disposed the chiefs if he proved to be a bad leader. Now that system, we didn't, or no, uh, the chiefs wouldn't run for election for every two years or four years, make promises to the people, and uh, when he got in, uh, do anything else he wants, you know. We never had a Watergate in the Indian system. <laughs> so, because the women were very quick, they, they watch their people, they watch their men folk from the time they're small to they, they grow up. And they want to see the kind of leaders that they're going to be, the way they speak. In order to qualify to be a sachem, you ought to speak good. See good, hear good. You have to know your ceremonies and your songs and your dances. And you have to prove that you can look after your family and the welfare of your nation, your own clan. And that's how women will judge you. And as you're growing up, they know that you'll be a good leader because you can speak well of your people. Now, if a chief or a sachem didn't become a good leader, and he was already in office, they gave him three chances. If there was a council that was for the people themselves, for the whole nation, and that chief was out fishing, when he got back, those women came to see him. And they said to that man, you hold a very important responsibility for he has been given a headdress. And a headdress of a deer antler. <coughs> Mohawks wear three eagle feathers. The antlers that he holds are the symbol of his authority. And they remind him of that, that the position he holds is very, very sacred to his people. Now, if he doesn't uphold that, they tell him, we'll be back two more times. The next time they have a council meeting, he might be out <coughs> hunting. So again, they come to see him. This time they say the same words, you hold very important position. People look up to you and you're supposed to provide and look after your nation. They ask him, why did he not attend that council meeting? And he might say, well, uh, I was out hunting which would not be a very good excuse. So then they will tell him that there will only be one more time that they will ever come to visit him. And he knows what that means. 
if that one time ever came, they would bring then a member of that clan that he belongs to, who would be like a warrior or just one of the men in his clan. The woman would bring one and he would come out with these words. That you would disgrace yourself before your own people, your own nation, your own clan. You will never in your lifetime become a chief. And then they left a mark on him. And in his society and in his people of all the Iroquois world, nobody ever looked at that man. Once they saw that mark, they know what it meant. He's disgraced himself. He used to be a sachem, but now he is invisible because his people would never look at him. And they used to, they used to say that if a person ever got that far, because it was unlikely that there were very few chiefs that would go that far as to disgrace themselves because in them days, the elders always said, if you cannot be honorable, then you were nothing in them days because that was the greatest prestige for a person to be. Now, he would go in the woods, no matter whether he's only 25 to 50, whether he had a long time to live. And he would serve out the rest of his remaining days of his life out in the wilderness because no matter where he went, he would be treated with silence. That was the custom. Very strong steps their people took. But again, the people themselves ruled their government. When a child was in the age of reason, whether it be boy or girl, man or woman, all had a voice in their own government. Again, women, the dominating, if their chichems was not sitting in council, they would go after him and make sure there is others sitting behind him. They called them the Danuta. One of their men would leave, one would sit right away. Because at other times, you see, a sachem could be sick or he could be injured. And he would have to be, if he didn't see, this one would be his ears. If he couldn't hear, he was not deposed of, another young person would come along and he would be his ear until he died if he was sick. Only if he did wrong could he be dehorned. Now, I want to show you how these five nations met in Grand Council. Again, it's almost the same system. You have the Mohawks, the Senecas, Oneidas, Cayugas, Onondagas. They're the well. I don't know if I, how you would interpret Jehonah, uh, we said the well, it's a direct translation. It means that where the bill is born, or the speaker of the house as he's sitting, he introduces, somebody would introduce a bill, well this is where they introduce the bill. So it comes here, there the well here. So naturally it would go to the Cayugas. The Cayugas and the Oneidas would deliberate whether the things that is concerning all the five nations and other nations that were uh, in conjunction with the Confederacy. Well, after deliberations, it would go to the other. I must explain first, the Mohawks and the Senecas were known as the older brothers. The uh, Oneidas and the Cayugas were known as the younger brothers. The Mohawks and the Senecas were known as the older brothers because also the Onondagas, they were the more populated, more stronger. When a, a sachem died, let me just jump back to here. It was the younger brothers who came, these two, to condole any of the older brothers, whether it be Senecas, Onondagas, or Mohawks. And when he died, one of these pigs would come out, whoever, what title he would hold. So, they had a ceremony called the Condolence Ceremony. I talk about three hours, a man would sing. He calls out the title of every chief, and there's 50 of them. And he tells his position, what it means. And he sings, he goes back and forth across the room. Long time it takes for that ceremony. And then after, then they bring the man who belongs to that clan, who the women have selected, and then he'll go across with them. And then the elders give him a talking, what his responsibilities will be. So it's not just a, 
donning of that long feathered headdress, as popular beliefs has it, it was very strenuous. Now, get back to this. After they had deliberations over here, it would go to the Oneidas. Again, they would counsel. Finally, the younger brothers sent it back. Now, they all agree here. The Onondagas, who was the fire keepers of the Confederacy, by fire keepers we mean the capital, like Ottawa or Washington. It was the Onondagas who were the keepers of the fire, or the council fire, who called the meetings. And I remember I told you about that man that has seven crooks in his body, that had hair of snakes. Well, he now has a position. He calls the Confederacy meetings, the Grand Council of all the Haudenosaunee or the Confederacy. And Hadadaho now has a very important position, but still, he is still just here. No higher than the rest. And in that world, they did not have kings, barons, queens, presidents, prime ministers. Nobody was higher. They were all the same length, the same height, equal. Now, when these two parties agreed, it went before the Onondagas, who will say again, we have been listening to the deliberations. It appears that the decisions that has been made between the younger brothers and the older brothers is a good <coughs> or our council or the nation of the five nations or the six nations. Now, they could also say that in your deliberations you do not seem to be so sure. So we send it back. And we want further deliberation on her. Because one of the things in your governments and in the United States governments, they have what they call majority rule. There's no such thing in a traditional government. Unanimous. Sometimes they meet for a couple of days, when sometimes many days. But always everybody agreed, all the nations, before anything became law. Many speakers became good speakers when they were trained by the elders to be able to express themselves well. And they were, nations would have their best speakers to try to reason it out with the others. And all the wise men, the chiefs would sit and they would listen. And so this was how come very many important decisions were made and this is the system as it dragged on. When the 13 colonies were here, they asked if they could receive protection from the Iroquois people and be under this tree. Other people, the French came in, the English came in, they asked the same thing. Now this is as we know it. <coughs> I know when I went to school, I didn't learn these things. I learned something else. I learned that Champlain beat up on some savage Iroquois over there, four of them, and it caused a feud between the French and the Iroquois. And the Iroquois beat up the friends of the French who were the Hurons. Well, after learning that in school, I went back home to my elders and I asked them, how can that be true? For as a small child, my grandfather had been teaching me my side of Indian history. So when I grew up, and I said, how can we, if we were living in peace with other Indian nations, how can this book say that we have been scalping and wiping them right off? No more here on today, they tell us. Except for Max Blue Louis. <laughs> <laughs> no. He told me, he says, when you go to school, see I didn't go to school till I was nine years old. Now I speak three Indian languages. I understand a few others. My English is not perfect and I don't care. It will be perfect as time goes on. Not never perfect, but I'm <laughs> satisfied. <laughs> now, he told me his version, as other elders that I've come across. History in this country was written one way, and that's the majority. So he says, when they say that they discovered this country, they discovered that, and they look at you, and your people have always been here, and all of a sudden, they put a flag down here and it says, I claim this land. My kin gave it to me 3,000 miles across the ocean. Very generous. That, as a matter of fact, that the people have been living here, he says, in your history books, the books that you come home, you tell me that these things are true. He says, I'll never believe them. 
They contain only half-truths, sometimes non-truths. I continue with my investigation, learning from other elders about what my Indian world, what it told, the philosophy that it, they had. Now, there's many good things I can say about the Indian people. About over 200 years ago, there was a man, I guess in English you'd call him a prophet. He prophesied what would happen into the future. He was a Seneca. He was one of the chieftains at the time, carried the name of Rangalio, Rangalio, or Rangalio. And he told all his people, like everybody has gathered here, he had been sick a long time. You might say he had a vision. He says, for our people, you must watch. There's a day coming. There's a day coming the trees will die from the top down. The animal life in the water will get sick. The rivers, too, is going to, get, it's going to slowly die. Your children that are around you will be speaking in a different tongue than, you, than yours. And he also says, you will listen birds that used to sing day to night, early in the morning, will not be singing anymore. They will be the first signs. <clears throat> and destruction is coming upon at that time. Well, this has been told over and over again from that time on, generation to generation, from grandfathers to grandfathers to ceremonies, it's always been repeated. And now, we don't repeat that no more because we're living in it. So I can't say my people were, didn't know nothing of things that I found out. And now I can go to schools and I can say I'm proud that because these are the things. We know the signs. Because in those things that were to happen, they offered solutions of what we must do. And that's one of the reasons that I was in Sweden. Now, I'm telling you this when you ask me to tell you about the different forms of uh, politics or governments from the 1950s on, and I've started right back from the time of Columbus and before that, because in the, from the 50s on, the Canadian government tried desperately to suppress a government like this. And in 1924, they sent RCMP to all any Iroquois reservations who still ran their governments like this by weapons, firearms. Now my reserve, they killed the oldest chief there was on there in cold blood. As soon as he comes through that door, he was shot down. They took many things that they needed to run, to open their meetings for the ceremonies, wampums, as a matter of fact, I think I remember one time I come in here that they had just gone through. I come in here, there's a lot of RCMP. I don't know if there's any here tonight, but she come over there and told me she don't know if I can speak here tonight. I just come through a pile of mess in Ottawa, trying to gain that back. But this, thanks, wampums is very important to our people. One other terminology that we want to explain is that wampums does not mean money to us. It is important, but it's not money. It used to record certain historical events, certain ceremonies and how they were to be done at time of history, other important events, certain ceremonies, things that the people needed to remind themselves, messages that they used to send out. They would be strung out this way. And as a matter of fact, each nation had a long string of wampum. That was their fire. That kept burning. And the sacredest thing that a man could do was he could say, this is what I'm going to do. The sachems would come out and say, then say it that you'll do it, hold this, and say it again. For every Indian was always afraid. On his honor, that's what it means when he holds that. Well, all these things, in 1924, the Canadian government took all this to Ottawa. Some of it's still being held by the RCMP. Some of it is in the National Museum of uh, Man in Ottawa. And they say that they were donated or that they had bought from the Iroquois people. And we've been uh, deliberating over that for the last few years. But the Iroquois people in 1924 desperately tried to hang on to this type of government. 
what they brought in. It started back from 1888, was called the New Indian Advancement Act. In other words, civilized the Indian people. So they had rejected this. In other parts where Indians were driven onto reserves, where they didn't move out of their territory, they were driven out of the reserve. This worked very well with Indians that were out west or nomadic. Now, I didn't say it worked well that they adjusted so happily because they were probably sent to rocky, barren land that they right that the white man didn't meet yet for a while. That's where he put them. But in our situation, we lived by the St. Lawrence River. We would not move. In other parts, the only thing we got caught up in is the revolution, the American Revolution. And some of the more educated Indians, like Joseph Brandt, persuaded the Mohawks to side with the British. I feel which is the biggest mistake the Mohawks ever made. We lost a whole part of New York State. So it says, come down <coughs> south to uh, Canada. We'll re-give you back all your land that you lost over there in the country, and you shall be sovereign over here. You and I again will be equals, which was not done. A few years later, the queen says, I am your mother. The king says, I am your father. The Indian agent comes down here, and he says, I'm your uncle. <laughs> <laughs> so everybody was always high. Their belief was that everybody was equal. Somebody was supreme, but not the, not the Indian agent. So, a lot of people died. A lot of people went to prison. I know others on my reserve went five years in prison because they wouldn't conform to the new laws called the Indian Advancement Act in 1924. Ten years elapsed before they tried to hold an election. In Conconawaga, the same thing. They wouldn't accept the Indian Act right offhand. Oka was the same thing. Many petitions were sent. One of our high school projects was we did research in the archives and we found out many things. How many petitions that went unanswered? They had signed 90% of the population saying, we don't want your laws, we have our own laws. You say it's democracy, we believe that this is democracy, what we've got, where the people do rule. But the Canadian government kept saying, my democracy is best for you. Because it meant that then, the lands that they still held could be called crown land. And if we ever choose to move off, or if we ever died off, then they could walk in. And they call it a law, reserved lands means today. Land that will be reserved for Indian people. Held in trust by the Crown. It means the Crown could kick us off our reservations if they had it their way, if we continue to believe that way. Really what happened was that that was part of the lands that we've never ceded over to the Crown, to Canada, to the United States. It's land that you all prove equally unpalatable to him, though the last difference is usually the most un. says, We have very little left. When your people came here, you had all the country. Beautiful it was. Animals were happy, rivers were happy, game was plentiful, and we were happy here. Today we are very small, yet still every day you people come say, I want this, I want that. He says, I'm different. He says, all I want, and he roll out this bear skin. Oh, just about so big. He says, all that will reach this bear skin is all the land I want. The Indian thought to himself, he says, they are very tricky people. How could he want such small land? I will rest upon it. So he went back in council and he came <coughs> back out and he says, well, again, I'll give you land. So that man went back, chose his spot, put down his rock, and he started cutting little peas off. He went all around. Then he pulled this string out. <laughs> and he got that much big land. And again, the Indian thought there's much to learn from the white man. <laughs> I'll tell you another one. You know, 
One of the ways they tried to break the spirit of the Indian people was to bar outlaw their ceremonies. And how they did that was the church and the Indian agent usually were working together, whichever children or Indian people they were looking after who they would say my children. And so they decided that in order for the Indian to progress, not only with the Indian Advancement <coughs> Act, but they should bar all their ceremonies so they become civilized. Every Sunday they go to church. They go to work. Soon they'll be like us, no more problems. And so they bar all their ceremonies. But you know, like my people used to have a ceremony called the white dog sacrifice. They used to eat dogs. That was a midwinter ceremony. That was a New Year celebration for the for our people. Sioux also had white dog sacrifice, you see. In the coldest Western Indians, as a matter of fact, all Indian nations. Now that wasn't cruelty. The purpose was a renewal of life. When a new cycle again began, in a cycle, like all in the belief, say there's a cycle, there's summer, spring, all this autumn, fall, and all the way down, it goes cycle. Your age goes in a cycle. Sun goes in a cycle. Earth is round cycle. And I could go continue as I've been told why we all live in a cycle. And this renewals themselves. The ceremony that they had was a special breed of dog. They were all white. And until that breed had run off, you see, or they had been outlawed, they don't have it no more. Nowadays in our ceremonies, the woman that will make the most beautiful basket, decorate, after everybody has looked at it and said, boy, would it look nice in my home? Then they would burn sacred tobacco with that. And that one day that was designated, and after everything is burnt, everybody takes one last look and you throw it into the fire, sacrificing. You know why? Because at certain times in your lifetime, you must sacrifice a few things. In order to realize there's many things that you have in life that you take granted for. So that was the way in uh, philosophy, well, to get back to the story, 14 years had gone by in this one village. And Indian people said they longed for eat the dog one more time. I guess to you people it must taste like hamburgers. No, like hamburgers. <laughs> well, to them, this was a mistake for them. And they did finally get a few Indians to go off the reservation and look for work, got them schooling a little bit. I want to talk about these two Indians. It's like me and him, we're always traveling around. You know, these two Indians got to the city. And uh, I guess it must be one of them fairs. The stories had been told down the generations. And as soon as they got to the city, they saw this big sign. It must have been a fair because this big sign says, hot dogs for sale. Right away, what do you mean hot dogs for sale? <laughs> How come they tell us we can't eat dogs and look at them people? <laughs> you know, look at the sign. Well, the other guy says, you know, says, we've been craving for hot dogs or we've been craving for to eat dogs for such a long time. Let's go eat the white man's dogs and find out what it tastes like. And we're walking up there and it says, two dogs. <laughs> oh, the man, there's some two dogs. The Indian takes them. Looks at it, the other guy looks at it, and then turns around and he says, God damn it, which part of the dog did you get? You know, like Mike, I want to give you an illustration. Many nights on the reservation when I was growing up, we used to have like all the people come around the house and tell, I don't know, this might have been happening to you too. I was raised by my grandparents. We always had elders down. We had a pot belly stove. We live on a farm. Five o'clock in the morning, we get up and milk the cows. But at night, the elders would come around and they would talk about Indian philosophy and Indian medicine, or the honors, and we do not know which path and these things. So, but all 
also all these things too they would talk about but in between it was a long night sometimes in the winter time they wouldn't go home for the next day today all our young people get home from school sit in front of that television and that's all they're getting knowledge but the knowledge is escaping them because they're living in a fantasy world I never wanted to watch television when I was small. As a matter of fact, I never wanted to go to sleep. Many times I was too scared. Because they told some pretty scary stories sometimes. So what I want to tell you is that to get back to what I was supposed to be down here for, <laughs> in 1950s, in 1959, there was a rebellion in Six Nations Reserve in uh, Brantford, Ontario. After that time that the Indian Act had been there, the Indian people finally emerged and said, we can't stand it no more. This Indian Act offers us no form of democracy whatsoever. The Indian agent to take to, to, take to us, what does he say that? Dictates. To, or he tells us what to do anyway. You know? <laughs> he uh, makes laws for us. And uh, the council that he has set up that's supposed to be elected for every term, that's where I can truly say that's where the Watergate begins because he says, they said that they offer no uh, voice to their people. Everything used to be decided by the Indian agent. He had a staff, RCMP left not too far away. They rebel, uh, rebelled, revolted. They threw the Indian Act Council, put in this kind of council, the old traditional council. That battle is still going on over there because they went to court. The bank council took these guys to court last year and said, we don't want these traditional chiefs or traditional people coming down to our progressive meetings. So they took them to the Ontario Supreme Court. And they lost. The court turned around and said, these people are the ones who signed the treaties, who still own these lands. They're the ones who should be sitting in council, controlling. So there was a lot of controversy from last year. I don't know, they recently, it was a reverse decision, so it's going to another court again. My reserve, same thing. But now I want to talk about the Indian Act system, which we have on our, all the reserves. Every two years, there's an election. My reserve, we have three districts. Cornwall Island, same as Quebec, uh, Snai, and these two parts in Quebec, we're in Ontario. There's another reserve here. Same reservation, same people, but there's a river, and by this United States over here. This is Canada. That's Ontario. This is Quebec. Franklin County. St. Lawrence County. Uh, well, anyway, just to give you an idea that they've chopped up our reserve pretty, pretty much. Within a Canadian set where we follow the Canadian system, how the system goes is that every two years they call an election. And in this election, people go up and they, just like in your country, they uh, nominate someone. Now they set a date, nominations, if people go in. Now they come back, they set another date when the elections will be held. And they send you a letter that says, <coughs> if I was asked to be chief, I could have 24 hours to reply and say, I don't want to be. So I could send them a letter back saying, I don't want to be chief. So usually on population basis, if you got a thousand, then you could have three counselors or three chiefs. On our reservation, we have 3,000, 3,500 on the Canadian side. We have another three and a half thousand on this side, but on this side we have 12 councillors on each district now. The population is getting bigger. Should. <coughs> Last year in Ontario, we had our own water game. Elections were, some of the men came over there and says, I want you to vote for me. So, Yes, uh, people used to say that that's voting a white man's way, and a lot of the, a lot of Iroquois and a lot of people in eastern Canada won't vote this way. So what you'll have on the reservation is a small turnout, few people vote, and in the United States, that's the voice of the majority. 
And in a population of 4,000, when you get about 25 people to vote, and he says, well, that's what they want for their leaders. And that's the way it's been working for them from 1900 on to now. Last year, they had an election on my reserve, and the same thing happened. Only this time, some ambitious guys wanted to become chiefs. <coughs> so they stood over there. Whoever came in, better vote for me. So the guy would go vote for them. But some of the other people protested, went to Ottawa, House of Commons, democracy. They called a new election. This time, you don't punch anybody out to vote for you. Maybe you can pay him. I don't know. <laughs> so they're going to set a new election day. But to say the whole thing, if we really understood it, we to compare these two elections, we would take this any time if we had a choice. Because here we were free people. We counsel for our own nation. That's why, when at the beginning I says, here there were free people, they were their own nation. Here there were words of the government, they were children of the government, they were responsible to the government, the government made laws for them under the band council system. Now, these band councils belong to organizations. Organizations that is called provincial organizations. In Quebec, they're known as the Quebec Indian Association. The Eskimos also have an association, but the Indian this Quebec Indian Association is comprised of band councils from different reservations. They have a national organization. This would be the Union of Ontario Indians, the Iroquois and Allied Indians, Treaty Number no. Nine, Treaty Number no. Three. In Ontario, they got many organizations, so they got booted up. But anyways, the National Indian Brotherhood represents all the elective chiefs of Canada, and they are the one who is in opposition to the government and their policies, which is Indian affairs policy. And that's roughly the way everything, all the system works. Now, a lot of times we have to take money at NIB from Indian Affairs so we can fight their policies, and it's very hard sometimes. The Quebec Indian Association has to take money from the government so that it can try to protect their Indian people. Now, you've probably heard the term many times, you can take the money from your enemy, but you don't know. Your enemy is already going to know what you're going to do with that money. So the Quebec Indian Association is fighting the James Bay Power Dam. And the best way I think that they're going to beat them is by uniting all their people. They got all the money in the world, as Barassa, I feel, has proven it. You make all kinds of those promises. But the powerful, most powerful people you'll ever find is a small bunch of united people. Other countries, other nations have proven that by being united. You can be very strong. Disunited, you can be nothing. And I think that in Ottawa, they find where our representative is supposed to be in Indian Affairs is very disorganized. So in short, from that time on to the kind of system that we have, to the provincial organizations, to the national organizations, that's the type of politics that we have in Canada, Indian politics. Now, I want to break here and ask if there's any questions. Fine. Nice. <laughs> Why don't we just sit around and uh, let me have a smoke? Yeah. <laughs> Do you have a question? Well, let me just say a remark on that is that when you take the money from the government, it's pretty hard to take it. You know, what kind of solution do you see to something like that? And what kind of solution are you working on? The, uh, most times the Indians won the battle was when they had to do it on their own. Most battles that were won was when they were the most poor, but they had the spirit inside them. Nowadays, money has been heaped upon it, and it really seems to be getting anywhere. But I feel that the voice to reach across the world, and just like in Canada, I'll, I'll give you the example, like, uh, like I said, there was uh, about 6,000 in our reservation. When the government says we don't recognize your treaty, as I said, our country is split in half. People power is what made the government back down because we organized, we shut down the border. We didn't go to the bank council, we didn't go to the government. 
although we tried to have talks with them, as soon as they said, we don't want to talk to you, we stopped going. And we went back home and the elder says, you must make a stand. You must do it without money. So we did a non-violent. We weren't going to, we weren't at that time going to fight back or anything, but we just went back to our homeland, which has been leased out to the seaway so they can build an international bridge. There was a customs right there. After that, the Canadian people were informed that their representatives in Ottawa were breaking laws and were breaking treaties. And then they had says, how do you expect to be respected by other countries if you can't even keep treaties with your own, with your own countrymen, with your own people, Indians in your own country? So, more pressure and pressure grew from citizens of all over the country because we were not violent people. Government stepped back and they says, all right, the Indians can cross the border, but they must be examined. And we says, sure, we'll be examined, but don't rough us up at the border as you've been doing in the past. We were free again at the border. By organizing that way, it was one solution. Because we were few and use are many, we look for you to understand what our existing problems are. And because we also feel that a, a lot of people in, across the ocean don't know our problems. The more Indian people get educated today, the more they are looking towards over there to make sure that everybody knows what's going on. The third world, as they call it, the people that I met with last week, very interested to see here what's going on over here because it says you people are of the third world too. And so it says new nations are spinning up in Africa all the time countries. Asia, the same thing. And that says that they would like to make contact with the Indian people over here to find out whether they can truly be sovereign people and whether it's viable to be economically, physically independent. And so I explained us this, we also do take pride in living where we are, but the encroachment and the unfairness that has happened is what we don't want to have happen. What I says in our trees and everything, in our government, what our elders say is what they call quasi independent. That means that we can still roam. I can still come to Montreal, but back home I can go back to my own country. A perfect example of that was when I heard the translation from Manitou, Manitou Island, it means God's country. Akwazasna to me means the same thing. It means my country, my homeland. Some of you people have homelands in Germany or England and them parts. You always think about that. You're proud of that. I says, we're proud, we have a base. But even if we cross into the United States, we cross into Canada, we should still be free people. But we have that every right to have a base because that's the land, the homeland that we still want to protect. And we can always look back, it burns in here. And everybody's got to have something burning in here. So that's one of, or maybe two of my solutions. But I'm very much against <coughs> fighting in, in, the, in this manner that you're taking all this amount of money. The other thing too is if they, nowadays in politics they're talking about the Lands Commission, the Claims Commission, paying off the Indians for what is being owed to them for their land rights. That's just going to drag on for quite a bit further yet. All the money that's been invested in if they make offers it would break probably the Canadian government if they had to pay all the Indians off right away. But the way I see it, it's going to be very difficult for everybody to see. You know, like right now, the treaty money and whatever money Indians get, they say it's a Canadian taxpayer's dollars. Or it comes in form of relief. <coughs> and when the Indian people finally get it, the government every year makes an announcement, the Minister of Indian Affairs says, this year, we are allotting $10 million to the Indian people, $5 million to the Indian people. And then some wise guy, a member of parliament gets up and he asks, he says, how much of that finally gets to the Indian people? After you've paid off all your politicians, your Department of Indian Affairs and the paperwork and your propaganda, your policies, before it gets to the reservation with their own programs, how much finally gets down there? That's what you should announce. And so these types of things just keep on, on going and going, but from the 50s to the 60s was one era where the Indian people finally started to move, started to 
a little bit and be inspired to fight back. In the 60s to the 70s, they really fought back. They began to put people in the right places here and there. Now in the 70s, many young people are spinning up all over. They have ideas, other than the ideas that the people, their leaders that were in the 60s and in the 50s. In the 60s, it was progressive mind. The young Indian people that are growing up today, that are being leaders, to say, yes, we must have a future. But to have a future, we must have a past to have a present. And so, you see young Indian people going up, saying, I must have respect for what I am, for what my people are, for their ceremonies, for the language, for the culture, everything that's all embedded into one. I have a right to hang on to that. I have a right to live in your society. It's like any help, any one of these. And that's what young Indian leaders are going to be like in the 70s. That's the kind of uh, negotiating that's going to be done. They're still going to go after it, but they're still mixed, you see. Many reservations. Uh, I'll say the churches is losing their stronghold on the Indian people. You don't see that much Indian agent influence in the 70s. It's slowly sipping away. Now they're giving self-government to Indian people, but it's self-government the way Ottawa has designed it. And I think we'll slip out of that. And I think 1970 to 1980, you'll see what the Indian people's determinations will be. You know, we're either going to slowly sink or we're going to break out, break loose. And by the way, if you want to find out more, you contact the North American <coughs> Indian Embassy in Ottawa. <laughs> and we'll tell you more about the Indian situation. <laughs> Any other questions? The Indians is a third world people. Do you think it would be necessary, like most of the other third world people, to have violence to really bring together the Indian people? When I went down, when I addressed the uh, third world portion of the United Nations, this is what they were wondering. Is this what everybody's got to go through? Just the way my people were is they didn't believe in violence. That they have a formula here. And it took me about two hours to explain. But I had my belts, I had my everything that I needed to use to make them understand. I had films that I had been documented by my by my own crew. <coughs> right away this is this is why they want Indians to go out there and make contact with them. Because even though they're independent now, they have their own nation, they have their own countries. There's still this feud with their own people. Still a little bickering, you know. And he says, we haven't yet found a formula on how to get along, much less to say with all mankind, with all over the world. So they said, what did they turn to they use? They said, honky has been pushing us around a long time. We finally got rid of him. And now we're finding that we're pushing him around and trying to get him out of there. So we really haven't found out the formula. And now you Indian people come along and say, there is a formula for a possible peace, brotherhood, and righteousness. And we'd like you to come around and maybe this will be a better world. So I think just a few of the people to get our elders over there, even within Canada, to give our elders a voice and have them listen to them, I think will make a great deal of difference not only on our reservations, but maybe on Canada as well. Any other questions? Could you elaborate on the North American Indian Embassy as to uh, its plans and as to its existence? <laughs> the uh, embassy that we have now used to be formally called the uh, National Canadian Defense. <laughs> uh, we figured that was a good place to, to pick on, but it was abandoned. They weren't using it. They had moved to another location. And so we took the building over again because in Ottawa, a lot of negotiating gets done with Indian groups there, but they have no place to go but a few choice hotels where they're not, they're kind of lower class and the Indians go there. And that's the only time you ever want, if you go looking for an Indian, you say, where can I find some Indians to see? Go to the Beacon Arms Hotel and you find Indians over there. And so within there, there sits uh, a group that would be Department of Indian Affairs Indians, those who work for that organization. You have another group here sitting on this side of the room. They'll be working for the National Indian Brotherhood. You have another group of Indians living on this, uh, sitting on this side of the corner. They'll be working for the 
Native Council of Canada, and they're all kind of like split up. And if an Indian walks in there that has no knowledge of this, and if he bumps into the wrong crowd and sits with the wrong crowd, somebody's pulling them over. Now, this happened to me a lot of times. And so we offer, he says, what would be a center, a base for all Indians that they could go to? And what would stimulate their interest and what would stimulate them culturally to come back and help their people? Because we're losing a lot of our younger people to get educated. They keep on going. They never come back home, help their own people. So one of this is that we don't have an embassy. And we started to notice that all these countries, all over different parts of the world, they have a little dot. In every country they have representation, you see. So we figured that would be the best thing to do. And so we're all the different worlds, if they want information, they can contact this place. And they're having their problems because it was a movement that was led by young people who do so much and they need help from their elders. And right in the middle is the Indian organizations who don't quite know yet, you see, by taking money from government, if they get directly involved, there's always a problem that they can get cut out. They like to help, they're kind of stuck right now, and I think in the next couple of months, a move is going to have to be determined to see which way it's going to go. Younger people that are determined to help their people are caught up in a bind because they have no source of money except from what a lot of the people from around the country are sending donations, sending food, they're sending whatever they can to help them out. And really what we must do, I, was, I got in contact with them as soon as I got back, they said we must get information out to the people, to the public. Because they say we're, we cannot be, we've been branded communism, or Marxist, and all these other uh, left wing, and every time an Indian takes a, a stand, they never give credit to him that he's got something to say. I know every time we've been involved in any kind of demonstration, even though it was always peaceful, they says they were inspired by the communists, they were inspired by this group. And they must be considered we're, we're pretty dumb not to be able to think of something of our own. You know? But this is the way it's been going. Now we feel that the embassy is a good idea. It can really go far by educating not only our own people, unite our own people, but it can be a good stepping stone to educating with our other Canadians within our own terms as equals. And that is the whole purpose of the Indian embassy. Is that it? Thank you very much. Didn't sing. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, we're trying to look at an image. Everywhere we go, we make it a point now to visit most high schools, universities, even public schools. And when we started all visiting them, you know, you walk into a classroom and uh, you give a speech, and then later on they ask you if you would uh, explain about the history. Could you go get your hat, your, your head dressed long, <laughs> feather-like, you know? I say, well, not all Indians dress like that. And not all Indians come on top of the mountain and come on their horseback, you know? And then you hear, do 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 <laughs> So we have to re-educate everybody that is being educated today. And so he says, Indian sounds to us are very beautiful, they have a meaning. And we only, or we only started doing this because we felt that there are other Indians still going around today to where other people will gather, where they will bring them to us. Say, we'd like you to speak to us because you're an Indian. And then they will go there and they'll beat the drum, do 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 and they go hopping around just like it was old Hollywood again, you know, and we're trying to live that down. Now there were sounds. There were songs for, uh, they had ceremonies. Iroquois people alone have 32 different songs and dances. Now there were songs, uh, they had ceremonies. Iroquois people alone have 32 different songs and dances. Uh, they had ceremonies. Iroquois people alone have 32 different songs and dances. Now there were, uh, they had ceremonies. Iroquois people alone have 32 different songs and dances. Now there were, uh, they had ceremonies. Iroquois people alone have 32 different songs and dances. Now there were, uh, 
They had ceremonies. The Iroquois people alone have 32 different songs and dances. Now they were, uh, they had ceremonies. The Iroquois people alone have 32 different songs and dances. Now they were, uh, they had ceremonies. The Iroquois people alone have 32 different songs and dances. Now they were, uh, they had ceremonies. The Iroquois people alone have 32 different songs and dances. Now they were, uh, they had ceremonies. The Iroquois people alone have 32 different songs and dances. Now they were, uh, they had ceremonies. The Iroquois people alone have 32 different songs and dances. They had ceremonies. The Iroquois people alone have 32 different songs and dances. Now they were, uh, they had ceremonies. The Iroquois people alone have 32 different songs and dances. Now they were, in the midwinter where this is a renewal of life is made, four days to sit aside and they sing and dance. The maple syrup comes out in the springtime, there's a song for that. It's a thanksgiving for that they have gotten that far in that cycle. Springtime comes, the strawberry grows, and again they have a strawberry ceremony. And they give them thanks that they have reached that far in the cycle. The corn grows, and they say they have another ceremony, says they have gotten to that cycle. They have a corn song. And they finally get right down to harvest. And it says, we have made it this far in this cycle. Then we have another ceremony, four days, and it keeps right on going into that cycle, you see. Now the dancers, they have social songs, and they have kind of like what you call uh, sacred songs that would never be sing, sung outside their ceremonial lawn houses. The songs that we kind of like to, to say, instead of the, what you hear on TV, and sometimes you hear a Western Indian singing, and our songs are very different. Uh, can we borrow those two chairs? Sure. So we're going to sing you some songs. Equally unpalatable to them. And not the view of the most unforgivable. Largely are they included unless they be learned. that we usually sing is a thanksgiving song thanksgiving for everything that you have a good day proud to see people nice to know that everybody's happy they're living the cycle is going on so you're seeing a thanksgiving address it's a thanksgiving song is what you sing and after that you're seeing a song for women who are also givers of life and very placed very high in our society and then from there, they would start continuing all the other songs that would make them happy when they're grouped here for social purposes like.
woman songs. <coughs> say that that wasn't the way we take it it's not a show no. it's, uh, it's a sharing of an experience that uh, we feel that is going to be presented to give you a better idea of uh, certain kind of people that uh, they like to have maybe set the record straight they have reasons and justifications as to why they want to live a certain way which they feel is justified as far as they're concerned, they want to live that way. It's nice to be able to live in this land, but it's also nice to be living as you want to see it, as you'd like to see it. And by this, you know, we hate to be called performers, show people that we're not, because we don't know how to, you know, you're finding in people that always like to have, be laughing, good humor, everybody be happy, and we're no different. We hope that <coughs> this, uh, Coming up here has been something worthwhile. Thank you. last year and uh, tonight's speaker couldn't come last year which was my misfortune because I particularly wanted to hear him. This year he has come and I've got another meeting on in about a half an hour. So I'm simply going to introduce him and then the lady will take over as your host. Yes. And with Mr. O'Reilly's permission what we'll do is uh, simply ask him to make his presentation, uh, take a break whenever he feels it appropriate, if he feels it appropriate for about 10 minutes, usually after an hour, so it doesn't really matter. And then if he likes, when he finishes his presentation, to open it up to questions from you. As the phrase goes, really needs no introduction, and I always feel impelled to make one anyway, so I'm going to. Mr. O'Reilly, really already all know about pretty well. Certainly he's been featured enough in, in the press in the last year or so. It was his law firm which handled the case of the Indians of Northern Quebec against the Quebec government and the James Bay Corporation. To arrive at a settlement which certainly is unique in Canadian history and which for the first time opens up some possibilities for other settlements in other parts of Canada. And I might add that it's had quite an impact on the Indian community because the Indian belief has been for many years now that the courts are white and therefore they can never get any justice for their claims through the courts. Now there may be some quarrel about whether they got all they wanted and how much justice they actually got by operating through the courts this time. But they certainly got far more than native peoples have ever got before. So Mr. O'Reilly then has been at the center of perhaps the most important legal battle involving Canada's Indians and perhaps the most important battle of any kind. Mr. O'Reilly. Thank you very much. I'm asked to speak about uh, treaties 
in historical perspective. And I'll try as much as possible to stay on that subject. And uh, later on in the evening, uh, if you have questions about anything to do with Indian rights, I'll try and accommodate you. However, I have to caution you that because certain of these matters are before the courts, I won't be able to open up as much as I otherwise would like to. Uh, however, if you do want to get into uh, some of the topical questions of interest, such as what's happening in the Northwest Territories, perhaps in British Columbia, perhaps in Northern Quebec, and maybe elsewhere, I'll try and answer some of those questions, but I may not be able to fully answer. I'll start off by perhaps proposing to you that we should approach the question of treaties in a way which will start off by saying what is the nature of the Indian interest or right or title or claim, as the government likes to call it, and how that developed in an historical perspective. Secondly, what was the nature of treaties? What were, what were treaties all about? Were they some kind of sovereign compact between two nations? Were they simply agreements uh, regarding land? Or were they combinations of these things? And then I'll try and describe to you which type of areas were covered by these treaties, which type of Indians participated in those treaties. And then perhaps fourthly, we'll try and see what is the status of the question of, uh, of treaties today. And uh, obviously, I'll come back to this point, but there are large parts of Canada where there are no treaties. And I understand that this is basically the subject of the lecture which Max Bernard will give you next week. And there are large parts of Canada where there have been treaties with the Indian people. To start, putting things into an historical perspective, one should always go back to the time when there were only Indians roaming the continent of North America, and I'll stick particularly to Canada, what is presently within the geographical limits of Canada. Various Indian bands who were divided amongst linguistic groups or affiliations, but various Indian bands occupied specific parts of Canada. This was part of a process which had evolved over the centuries. But by about 1500, you had, of course, the Eskimos in the far north. You had the Micmacs uh, and the Malisets who tended to occupy specific parts of eastern Canada. In the central Quebec part, northern part, there were Nascapes, Montagny, some Micmacs lower down. You had the Crees, and you had the Inuit or Eskimo who were up top, and you had the, the uh, Iroquois who were basically along the lower St. Lawrence Valley and into Ontario and certain parts of southern Ontario. Uh, then you had the Ojibbeways and the Cree groups in Ontario, and then swinging west, mainly the Plains Cree, but also the Blackfeet and other groups, with which I'm, the Sotos, with which I'm not totally familiar. And then, of course, about six different groups, big groups, uh, in British Columbia. Now, specific areas were considered to be the hunting and fishing and trapping grounds of particular bands. In other words, particular regions divided geographically by boundaries such as rivers or mountains or lakes were considered to be the exclusive hunting and fishing and trapping grounds of a particular band. And of course, there were disputes between various bands. There were also some wars. Obviously, the, strangely enough, the, the Cree and the Inuit uh, uh, had several encounters in respect to boundary lines. And some of these boundaries fluctuated. But essentially, the main point is that Particular bands occupied distinct 
geographical areas as their exclusive grounds, which they happen to use because of the times, mainly for hunting and fishing and trapping purposes. It was only really with the coming of the whites to North America that they, in certain areas, became sedentary and started to farm. Although I'm not an expert in this area, I think that as a general statement, it can be said that most of the Indian groups were hunting and fishing and trapping for their livelihood. That is how they used the land. And obviously, if one is a farmer, one can use a fairly small plot of land and gain a fairly rich yield uh, from the earth, and one doesn't need to go into large areas uh, to nourish oneself. However, when you're hunting and fishing and trapping, obviously the animals are mobile, they don't stay still, you have to go after them. The yield from the land uh, can also vary with the seasons and can also vary according to nature. And this by itself was one reason why essentially very large tracts of land had to be occupied. So at the time of the white man's arrival in Canada, essentially all of Canada was divided into distinct geographical areas which were said to be the territories of particular bands. The bands themselves usually were broken into groups of families, very much along family lines and kinship lines, but all of these families would group, as a general rule, into settlements in particular seasons of the year. Out east it was mainly during the summer, when the number of families, the groups of, uh, of relatives, would come together into a common summer home, which, uh, which uh, say in the case of the James Bay Crees, usually was on the coast. And there they would talk together, they would hunt <coughs> together, they would fish, exchange stories. This would be the community life for a given period of the year. With the coming of the whites, starting with New France, the colony of New France, one makes the historical development between approximately 1608 and 1760, even 1763. One would see that effectively what was occupied by the French and the French settlers were very narrow strips of land adjacent to the main waterways, such as the St. Lawrence, the Richelieu, obviously, the Saguenay, and other tributaries of the St. Lawrence, even some along the Chaudière, going down towards the States. But for reasons of protection, for reasons of farming, and because the waterways were the main transportation arteries, essentially, the act of French occupation was restricted to areas adjacent to these main waterways. In terms of square miles, they were fairly limited compared to the vast areas which were being occupied by the uh, Indian people of the time. And as you know, you've read enough history to know, regardless of what some of the theories are as to the conquered and the conquerors, there were trading relations with most of the Indians established by the French and these trading relations <coughs> implicitly and basically recognized the Indian right, it seems to me, to continue to hunt and fish and trap over large tracts of country. Even if it was not a recognition of a right per se, in fact, that's what happened. The Indian people were not molested essentially in their hunting and fishing and trapping in the interior, nor for very large periods of French occupation in their use of the waterways. In Acadia and what is now the Maritime Provinces, very much the same phenomenon occurred. Up until, say, 1713, uh, and even up until 1760, very 
little of the large mass which was the maritime provinces at the time. Basically the colony of Nova Scotia and Cape Breton Island. What happened was that the Indian people were left free in their usual occupations of hunting and fishing and trapping. So that in 1760, let's say as a cutoff point, with the so-called British conquest, when the French transferred to England their rights over the territory, one has to examine what actually was being transferred in fact. In fact, there was an assertion of sovereignty or dominion over this land. There was an assertion that the French could make laws. And there was an assertion, on the other hand, by the British, that now they would have the power to make laws. But there was also one of the articles, this Articles of Capitulation, which were really the terms or surrenders, in virtue of which English rule would succeed French rule. One of the terms was that <coughs> the Indians were to be allowed to continue to possess the lands which were actually inhabited by them. That has legal significance, uh, as I'll try and point out in a few minutes. But factually, and this is the important point I want to make for now, factually, the Indian possession, their use of these large hunting and fishing and trapping grounds was not really molested, not really affected in any significant way. It was affected in certain areas along the St. Lawrence River, along the larger tributaries. In 1763, uh, uh, sorry, before I mention that, of course, in, in large parts of Canada, the, there was a dispute as to how much of Canada actually came under British rule or British sovereignty from the time of the granting of the Hudson's Bay Company Charter, which was 1670. Because in 1670, the charter contemplated or covered basically all of the land which was drained by Hudson's Bay or James Bay and of course all rivers flowing into James Bay or Hudson's Bay. Well that covered a very very large swath of Canada. I really didn't realize that geographically until a few years ago when we started to get into this but it actually encompasses large parts of the Northwest Territories, large parts of the provinces of Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta, of course Ontario, Quebec, uh, I guess the watershed is up around the Labrador boundary right now. But in any event, significant portions of Ontario, Quebec, the Prairie provinces, all were contemplated by this Hudson's Bay Company Charter. So it is arguable that from 1670, uh, these areas fell under so-called British sovereignty. But the policy followed by uh, the British, and in particular by Hudson's Bay Company, was, was essentially a fur trading policy. It was the same thing as with the French. They, they, I hate to use the word allowed, but in any event, de facto, in fact, Indians continued to use these grounds, their particular hunting and fishing and trapping grounds, as they had before. And there was even smaller interference with this occupation by the Hudson's Bay Company than by the French kings and the French governors and French habitants because the Hudson's Bay Company was primarily and exclusively interested in the fur trade and in getting the furs out. And in order to get the furs out, the Indian people had to keep using their lands for the purposes of cultivating and catching these furs. In 1763, then came a document you've all heard about, undoubtedly, called the Royal Proclamation of 1763 of King George III. And what did that do? We have to leave the confines of Canada for a moment and look at all of North America. As you know, the 13 colonies were basically along the eastern seaboard and had as their boundaries the Appalachian Mountains, which were not more than uh, a few hundred miles inland 
And this is where the basic American experience first took place, the, the American colonial experience first took place. As, uh, pardon me, very shortly after the American colonists started, and uh, even during the time of uh, William Penn, there had been compacts or treaties or agreements made with the Indian people whereby lands could be settled and cultivated and farmed. Whatever the motives may have been to prevent war or to recognize some kind of an interest, that was immaterial. There were these agreements. And it was acknowledged that these white colonial, colonialists could use the land up to about the Appalachian Mountains, right down to almost the Florida coast. In 1763, when George III and, and the Crown of England still had sway and political sovereignty over most of what was then called British North America, it was decided to draw a line and to regularize and systematize things because a number of outbreaks had come, a number of fairly serious Indian outbreaks, including, I believe, Pontiac's uprising around 1762 in the Detroit area. And it was felt that things had gone far enough and that in any event, settlement had to be controlled. And so the proclamation basically said that what was within colonies was to stay under the rule of governors, the governors of those colonies, who had a fair measure of independence, but were still responsible to the crown of England. Then, west of that mountain, a large swath of land, which, as we have seen, eventually extended uh, to the Pacific Ocean, west of that area, this was to be an area known as Indian Territory, meaning that exclusive Indian occupation was to be recognized. And this occupation was to be systematized in the sense that it could not be ended unless the Indian people consented to having their occupation ended. This was the proclamation of 1763. It said, what is within the colonies and what is within the colony of Quebec was to fall under a particular regime. Outside of that particular area, there was to be a large tract of land, basically all of the west and large parts of, of Ontario and large parts of the Mississippi Valley. All of that was to be Indian territory, where a special regime would govern, and then the colony of Quebec was set up. And Quebec, of course, was a much larger colony. It occupied a section down the middle of the continent of North America, and parts of Ontario, and most of what is now Quebec and Labrador. And they said in this colony of Quebec, the there was to be a governor and uh, eventually uh, a system of, uh, or the prelude to the system of responsible government which would be set up. And there was a caveat or a warning or a caution that this royal proclamation would apply to the Indian Territory, would apply to Quebec, although that's disputed, but what would not be within the Indian Territory was the land known as the Hudson's Bay Company Territory lands. This Rupert's land that I was talking about, which encompassed most, or a large part, of what is present-day Canada. But after geographically dividing North America that way, basically west of the Appalachians, up to approximately the middle of what are the present provinces of Canada, that area was to be known as the Indian Territory with the exception of a swath coming down which was like a forked extension of the colony of Quebec. And in that Indian Territory, it was stipulated in the proclamation that there could be no settlement unless there had been prior purchases of the interests of the Indians in those lands. And that those lands 
were to be reserved for the time being under the protection of the crown. Now, the, there's, a, there's a, a very large dispute right now as to whether the royal proclamation in reserving a specific area, this large Indian territory, for the exclusive use of the Indian people and recognizing, in effect, the use of the Indian people negated or wiped out or didn't recognize the rights of Indians in colonies and in the Hudson's Bay Company territory. That is still an outstanding legal question which hasn't been solved. There are those of us who argue that the Royal Proclamation in fact recognized the, uh, the right of Indian people to continue to uh, to enjoy their hunting and fishing and trapping rights, to continue to enjoy those lands as their hunting and fishing and trapping grounds. Uh, we base ourselves on a number of propositions, uh, one on the theory of uh, Aboriginal rights, which, which I'll try and elaborate quickly in a little while, base ourselves on instructions to governors within those colonies those instructions came from the Crown and in effect provided that the Indians were not to be molested in their particular lands and that when these lands were required for settlements, uh, there were supposed to be meetings with the chiefs and councils and the land was supposed to be surrendered and that no warrants of survey were to be given, meaning no patents were to be given by governors to whites even within those colonies unless uh, there had been a prior agreement on the part of the Indians. But it's still a controversial point. However, the Royal Proclamation is looked upon in many respects as the charter of Indian rights. Uh, meaning that it's a recognition, a pretty firm recognition, that there was an interest in the land which was enjoyed by the Indian people and that this interest was recognized under British law, whether or not it had been recognized under French law, it definitely was recognized under British law. Subsequently, cases decided that this interest was called a personal and a usufructuary interest. That's a pretty strange legal term, but it means, usus is a Latin word meaning use, really. And it's a right to enjoy the land and the fruits of the land, a right to possess land as if we're one were the owner, like the owner itself or himself, but not with absolute full rights of ownership. Because usually when you have an absolute right of ownership, you're allowed to do with the property what you want. You can destroy the property, you can sell it to whomever you want, you can give it away. Well. The Indian right was not recognized as going that far. While the Indian people wanted to enjoy that land, they could enjoy it as if they were the owners, but there was a limitation on their dis right to dispose of that land. They could not dispose of that land to anybody but the crown or the government. In other words, they couldn't sell it to any white settlers whom they thought they could get a good bargain from. They had to sell it to the crown and they had to go through a particular procedure. Now one can say immediately that from the Indian point of view, uh, they've come down a notch. They were, practically speaking, full owners of the land. They roamed over it at will. They took all the produce of the land. They took the animals. They took the furs. And now their right is reduced to one of, of uh, usufructory rights. Uh, how did that come about? Well, that's a theory of, of the law. According to the English system of jurisprudence, according to English theory, when the English crown, in quotation marks, or people working under the English crown, discovered America and occupied America, they assumed total sovereignty. That with that total sovereignty went not only the powers to make laws, but the powers to deal with the land 
in the most absolute manner and to deal with the subjects on that land. There's a very famous case called Campbell versus Hall, which in effect recognizes the sovereignty, the assumption of sovereignty by the crown upon new lands, newly occupied or newly discovered lands, but subject to the rights of the inhabitants to continue into the, in their rights, whatever rights they had before the assumption of British sovereignty, but on the condition that these rights could be terminated at any time. So in a nutshell, what that meant was that although the Indian rights were recognized as continuing by British law, because it was now British law applied by British courts which would govern according to British legal theory. Although Indians were recognized as being able to continue in the enjoyment of their lands, that land was no longer considered to be an absolute right, which of course it couldn't be considered to have been prior to the arrival of the white man. It was now considered to be a right to the enjoyment of that land. With this royal proclamation following, sorry, following the royal proclamation then, which was in certain respects the charter of Indian rights in the sense that it gave recognition, it gave formal legal recognition to Indian rights in America under the British system of law, but at the same time was a limitation of the Indian rights. From that time on, there was an added impetus to deal with Indian people. And from approximately 1780, when you had the influx of uh, United Empire loyalists after the American Revolution, and particularly into southern Ontario, and you had the push westward, the start of the push westward down in the States, dealings with Indian tribes there, you had a whole series of treaties covering basically southern Ontario, in a very haphazard fashion. But these were really the first treaties in the sense of land sessions, in the sense of Indians giving up their interests or rights in land, which took place in Canada. From approximately 1780 to about 1820. Now previously there had been arrangements or, or peace agreements under the French regime, uh, even between the Iroquois and, uh, and the French, did not deal with interest in land, they did not deal with surrenders. The same thing can be said of the Maritimes. There, there were a number of peace treaties and specific peace treaties, treaties of alliance, but they did not purport to give up, the Indians did not purport to give up any interests which they had in land, and the British Crown, after 1713, didn't, didn't pretend to take any interests in land. And as a matter of fact, just about the same time as the Royal Proclamation of 1763, there was a proclamation called Belcher's Proclamation in 1762, dealing with uh, the Atlantic provinces, basically, which said that the same sort of thing as the Royal Pro Proclamation, in fact, that Indians were to be maintained in the lands which they actually possessed, and that there were not to be, uh, that the Indians were not to be dispossessed of their hunting grounds uh, except uh, through a surrender procedure. So that concomitantly, at the same time, you had basically a recognition in both the Maritimes and in large parts of, of North America, the so-called Indian Territory, that uh, Indians had a right to the enjoyment of the land. There followed the beginning of the treaty process, and things were quiet for a while in Canada, Around 1820, you had you had the famous Selkirk Treaty, which dealt, uh, interestingly enough, with the Hudson's Bay Company territory that we were talking about. We argued in the James Bay case, supported by, I think, a number of documents, historical documents, uh, that the and instructions that the Hudson's Bay Company always acted in the same way as the British Crown acted, that there was a need before dispossessing Indians of any interest in land or before settling any land, there was a need to enter into a treaty with the Indian people. 
1821, the Selkirk Treaty, Selkirk got his land from the Hudson's Bay Company, was a prime example of that. And that was one of the few examples that existed before the Hudson's 